three stanza on the white panels on the left hand side, so you can follow along. So, Wallace Stevens was declared to be a vital part of American mythology and a prime mover of the American Imagist movement, uh, along with T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound. His work earned him a plethora of writing awards, including several honorary doctorates and a Pulitzer Prize for poetry. He believed the poet's purpose was to interpret the external world of thought and feeling through the imagination. After his death, he became enamored with Asian <clears throat> art. While this poem lacks any specific structure, it is most similar to a Japanese haiku. His parents' death is likely to have had him reflect on his own mortality. This poem is very ontological in nature, the definition's right there for you, uh, and it deals with perspective. So for instance, a simpler example would be that you're all watching this presentation here from different spots in the classroom. You all have a different point of view on the same thing, my presentation. We can't really get away with saying, yours is right and yours is wrong. We can only choose to accept that yours is valid. Our senses and our physical infrastructure, while very enabling, also limit our perspective. <clears throat> so here it is important to make note of the point of view. The scene is uh, viewed at a distance. I will discuss its importance later uh, with the conclusion of the poem. In an ontological sense, stanza one has to do with the inception, or the starting point of being. It correlates with the idea that there needs to be an observer in order for the universe to exist. For example, the tree falling, nobody around, does, anybody, or does it make a sound? Does anybody hear it? The scene here is largely white, with a black speck at its focal point. Compared to peripheral vision, our focal point is where movement is largely detected. It is symbolic of an eye, largely white, with a dark center. I think it poses the question, where do we look for answers? Are we looking in the right places? Um, furthermore, I think a youthful imagination is being presented here. If there is someone here to see this image, how can they see the movement of Blackbird's eye from that distance? I was of three minds, correlates to the expression being of two minds, meaning uh, being unable to decide between two things. Here, he is of three minds, which means he really can't decide. In the ontological sense, Stevens is contemplating the nature of being and has too many ideas to choose from. The American Imagist movement in which Stevens was a part of was not directly associated with religion, meaning that they would look at things from outside of religion. Now, that's not to say that our understanding of things might root from religion because of its own ontological nature. Perhaps he wishes to convey the idea that all religions contemplate being differently, and how can one be proven truer than the other? Uh, and then there's the tree. It could symbolize a sense of connection to the rest of the universe and our interdependence on other systems, uh, like the carbon-oxygen exchange between humans and plant life. The blackbirds represent the answers or our perceptions of our being. But the more we climb the tree, manipulate it, damage or destroy it, the birds fly further from our reach, signifying that this is something that we will never really truly come to understand. Again, note the change in season. This dramatic spectacle can be viewed as a loss of control. This is suggestive of another cycle, the life cycle. We like to think we have control over when and how we live or die. But we're never really in complete control. Our lives are only a small part of the bigger picture. In direct relation to Wallace Stevens, this stanza can be interpreted as a reflection of his career and his own life. With respects to the American Imagist movement, with, that has emphasis on using less words to carry a greater descriptive power, the very lines he has written can be interpreted differently or could have been written differently altogether. Hence, he was of three minds or three possibilities he could have cho chosen as his point of view. <clears throat> a man 
a woman and a blackbird, are different, but they find connection in the greater picture, or in terms of stanza three, the pantomime. This one reminds me of the holy matrimony. A man and a woman become one under God. They are united as they were in the Garden of Eden with animals like the blackbird. It also reminds me of yin and yang. Both sides are different, but together they complement each other in a balance. And the blackbird can exist within yin or yang without destabilizing it. <clears throat> Here he ponders being through auditory sensation. This stanza relates back to stanza two. Stevens cannot decide. Both inflections and innuendos are important in the art of poetry. This time, however, he is only of two minds. The blackbird whistling is an inflection, which can express mood. And the moment just after is the innuendo, the suggestive hint. Stevens is contemplating if the inflection of the whistle or the innuendo the blackbird is implying is more important to his understanding. It is important to note that he does not know which he prefers, meaning that his perception is relative to what he wants to believe or accept. Like Einstein says, put your hand on a hot stove for a minute, and it seems like an hour. Sit with a pretty girl for an hour, and it seems like a minute. <laughs> That's relativity. Our experience is relative to our, ourselves. But if I were to guess which he preferred with respect to the American Images movement, the beauty of innuendo is more significant due to the lack of rhythm and rhyme in this specific poem. <clears throat> this is another very image-heavy stanza with ontological symbolism. The icicles and barbaric glass give a sense of entrapment and enclosure. The icicles are like vertical bars and the blackbird wandering back and forth seemingly without purpose. Perhaps that is an illusion. <clears throat> and the one who is caged is looking from inside the dwelling, outside at the bird. The mood traced in the shadow is indecipherable. But in what context? From which perspective? Is the mood caused by the shadow? Or is the mood, in a more descriptive sense, in the shadow? One belongs to the blackbird, and the other to the observer. Whatever it is, the observer is a prisoner of his mind. This might be a sign of losing imagination, or, like the walls of the dwelling, reaching the boundaries of our understanding. Is this to shelter us? <clears throat> Can we handle a complete understanding of our being? Or would we break down, lose purpose, and wither away? In relationship to stanza five, is it better to enjoy life in the moment, or die to possibly learn its innuendo? Here, this stanza deals with a conflict of value between the intrinsic and extrinsic. Humans, and more historically, men, have been known to want to conquer the world. Comparatively, women tend to be more down to earth, at least in a symbolic sense. Stevens is saying that these thin men of Haddam chase empty dreams that won't bring them anything lasting. In a life so important, sorry, permanent, What's to collect? You only leave it behind anyway. Instead, appreciate that everything you need is available to you. This reminds me of the poem Ozymandias, a great king who once ruled an empire, but has clearly fallen and he's left nothing but the two feet and a head of a statue. For Ozymandias, it's a little too late to see what's around your feet. In the physical sense, these men could be malnourished because they cannot see that there are plenty of lovely women around them that could nurture them. In the spiritual sense, these men are thin and deprived because of their impossible hunger for what is out of reach. They may take on a heartier shape if they came to appreciate what they have. Here, he attributes his knowledge to the blackbird but is unsure of <clears throat> the way it participated. He only knows that it participated. The whistling of the blackbird in stanza five can be equitable to 
noble accents and lucid, inescapable rhythms of poetry. This serves to reinforce the idea that he prefers innuendo over inflection, as he feels without an understanding of what the whistles imply, he would not be able to compose his poetry. Stevens is recreating the rhythms and rhymes of the blackbird through imagery and symbolism. He is trying to imply to us that the American Images movement is just bringing on the ontological nature of blackbirds to our focal point. This complements the last stanza, stanza seven, as he is telling us that perhaps we should look where we don't always direct our attention at our feet and what's in front of us. <clears throat> this stanza here is very important as it alludes to a common theme in the poem, the circles of light. When the blackbird flies out of sight, it marks the edge of our understanding. We have a limited line of sight and have trouble seeing things at a distance. <clears throat> this contributes to our imagination and the creation of philosophical theories of existence. In relationship to stanza two, the closer we get to the blackbird, the further the horizon gets. It is all relative and cyclical, or rather infinite in nature. Because of this, we become caged in the dwellings of our minds. Here Stevens explores being with visual and auditory sensations. Again, note the change of the season. It is also important to note the two perspectives of pain and pleasure. The green light in the sky can be an indicator of approaching strong thunderstorms. Thunderstorms are usually experienced in the spring. This could symbolize an omen, a foreshadowing, or even a cleansing. Euphony is a sound with quality that's pleasing to the ear. A bod, a woman, in, a woman in charge of a brothel, arranges for customers to purchase pleasure. Whether or not Stevens intended it, <clears throat> it is suggested that this is symbolic of the Japanese concept of selling spring, where prostitution is characterized as an act of reducing a complex beauty to a cheap pleasure. So would the bods, who are trained to entice the men of Haddam, leaving them thin and penniless, cry out sharply in pain or pleasure? Do they cry out sharply in the pain of guilt, of exploitation, of what unites a man, a woman, and a blackbird? Or do they cry out in pleasure? Do they see that the beautiful green light, <clears throat> sorry, do they see the beautiful green light, or can they grasp that things are going to get turbulent? Furthermore, can they see that even after the storm, there is opportunity for new life to spring forth, or a new perspective for that. <clears throat> this stanza here contrasts heavily with stanza six. We now see from the outside in. The indecipherable mood becomes timid and fearful. In this stanza, through more symbolic imagery, we encounter a natural human sensation, fear. It is important to note that I, has now become he, as this extends the experience onto others. Much like a glass house, a glass coach <coughs> represents fragility and transparency with the added effect that it's in motion. The notion of fragility <coughs> and transparency shares a common ground with the last <coughs> stanza and the guilt the bods might be experiencing. Only a guilty man on the move would fear the illusion of a blackbird in the shadow of his equipage. For this man, he is either trying to outrun the turbulent storm encroaching behind him, or is chasing the blackbird toward the horizon, a pursuit that won't lead to a greater understanding, only more questions. Is he fake, an imposter, a fraud, or not deserving of success? If so, then he qualifies as a thin man of habit. Perhaps he is merely fearful of his mortality and what comes after life. This stanza presents the passing of winter with the melting of the ice. It is important to note the transition from the troubled preoccupations of the human mind to the consistency of nature. It is suggested that the river is marking the edge of one of many circles. <clears throat> winter is over. Because of this, 
the blackbird as a direct cause. Must be fun. The cause and effect represented in this stanza is one of the more graspable concepts in Stephen's poem. When the river flows, nature must be alive. The blackbird must be flying. Life is moving on. There are no perplexities, and there seems to be an understanding of what's going on. And finally, in conclusion, the poem brings us back to winter. It is important to note the stark contrast here. Evening all afternoon, and again, the blackbird against the snow. But this time, something's different. The perspective has changed. The blackbird is much closer. The afternoon could represent the middle of life, and the evening has found its place within it. This means death is closer, hence the change in perspective. There is only one blackbird as a focal point. The image I see here, <clears throat> in correlation with the first stanza, is a large black dot, the blackbird, with white specks at its center, with the eventual whiteout that comes with a heavy snow. To me, this evoked an image of a pupil slowly turning from a black pitch to the white haze that we see in the deceased. The blackbird, which is representative of death in Japanese culture, marks the edge of this, of a, <clears throat> marks the edge of the circle of this human's life. He is freed from the prison of his mind. This gives us an insight to stanza six. Perhaps the indecipherable cause was the blackbird waiting for the cycle to complete, for the river to run so it could fly, but also in anticipation of the mortality of man. And finally, I believe there's a bit of a hidden message here. <clears throat> So we're impermanent. He wants us to open our minds and live our life with an appreciation to what is around us in the moment. Ultimately, our ideologies, our material wealth, and our legacy, legacy will be left behind. And we have no control over its significance. <laughs> and then lastly, it's mo most important to note here that this poem is open for interpretation. Thank you.